Iniciamos la siguiente ponencia. Adelante. Buenos días. Buenos días. Sí, está pulsado y está fundido. Buenas. Iniciamos la siguiente ponencia eh, que lleva por título Excavaciones y preservación arqueológica en Alemania y de la que es responsable el profesor doctor eh, Michael Rind. Uh, it's beginning the next uh, lecture given by Professor Michael Rind, Director of Archaeology of the Lands Landschaft Berban des Fallenlippe, LWL. El profesor Rind es prehistoriador y arqueólogo y es presidente del Landschaft Berban des Fallenlippe, de un, un organismo profesional del Estado de Westfalia Lippe en Alemania, que se ocupa de la investigación, la gestión y la difusión del patrimonio, especialmente el arqueológico, en el Estado, en el Land de Westfalia Lippe en Alemania. Eh, el profesor eh, Rind es, como he dicho, prehistoriador y arqueólogo. He is a, uh, an archaeologist and uh, is a professor in several Uh, universities in Germany, especially at the University of Münster, that has given lectures and, te and taught archaeology and history at the universities of Regensburg, Bamberg, Innsbruck, and Vienna. El profesor uh, Rin ejerce su docencia en la Universidad de Münster, pero con anterioridad ha ejercido también labores docentes en diferentes universidades alemanas, uh, como las de Regensburg. O Innsbruck, amén de la Universidad de Viena. Es presidente de la Asociación Federal de Arqueólogos de Alemania. He is the president of the Federal Association of Archaeologists in Germany since 2015. Yes. Desde 2015. Es miembro del Comité de la Asociación Alemana para Arqueología. He is a member of the board of the German Association for Archaeology. Y es miembro también del Comité del Instituto Ludwig Boltzmann para uh, las prospecciones arqueológicas y para la arqueología virtual. He's a member of the board of the Institute Ludwig Boltzmann for Archaeological, Archaeological Prospections and Virtual Archaeology. Él viene a hablarnos hoy sobre eh, las excavaciones y la preservación arqueológica en Alemania y no quiero extenderme más cediéndole la palabra y agradeciéndole su presencia hoy en el tercer Congreso Nacional Uh, de arqueología profesional en España. Thank you very much, Professor, for being here. Thank you for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. On behalf of the Association of State Archaeologists in the Federal Republic of Germany, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to give a short overview about the situation of excavations and archaeological preservation in Germany. As a poor scientist with not much time, I tried to make my job easy. So I asked artificial intelligence how archaeological monument preservation works in Germany. The answer came promptly. The chat is busy right now, please be patient. But since I'm an impatient person, I then sat down at the desk in the classic way and tried to compile an overview of archaeology in Germany for you here in Madrid. I hope you are satisfied with the results. Unfortunately, in the short time available, I can only present singular examples from the work of archaeological monument preservation in Germany. It is not easy to understand the structure of archaeological monument preservation in Germany. This is mainly due to the fact that ground monument preservation is not centrally controlled. It is not the federal government that is responsible, but all the states. But at first, I want to make a definition. What is meant by a monument? A typical example of a monument is the Hermann's Monument near Detmold in Westphalia, built to commemorate the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in the year 9, Anna Domini, in which the Caruscan Prince Arminius destroyed three regions Roman legions of Populus Quintilius Varus. It was inaugurated in 1875. But can 
a glider, an aeroplane, be a monument? Yes, in this case it is really in Germany, but these two half-timbered buildings are not monuments. One has too little old substance, the other is a replique. And what is an archaeological monument? A ground monument? What is a movable ground monument? Is it conceivable that the forced mask nuclear repository in Sweden will soon be worthy of monument status? And what about this enigma, the so-called Hitler mill from a forest near Eying in Bavaria? Is this a movable ground monument or just a find from the National Socialist era? As you can see, there are many questions and many answers. But besides the fundamental questions, there is another big problem in Germany. And this problem is called federalism. Federalism in Germany, that means 16 states in the Federal Republic, each with its own cultural sovereignty. In Schleswig-Holstein, Lower Saxony, Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, Thuringia, Saxony, Saxony-Anhalt, Hessen, North Rhine-Westphalia, Rhineland-Palatinate, Saarland, Baden-Württemberg, and Bavaria. And in addition, the cities, state cities, are Bremen, Berlin, and Hamburg. The cities of Cologne and Lübeck have a special status. 16 monument protection laws. In Germany, we have 16 different monument protection laws. In each country, its own. And you can imagine what that means. But at first, I want to show you the most important sites, the archaeological world heritage sites in Germany, which belongs to the archaeology. 42 sites in Germany are included in the UNESCO World Heritage List. They all possess the outstanding universal value that is a prerequisite for this seal of approval. Uniqueness and authenticity must be given, and a management plan is a prerequisite. These include ensembles such as entire cities, for example, in Lübeck or Regensburg, outstanding buildings, for example, Porta Nigra in Trier, or landscapes like the upper middle Rhine Valley. And archaeologically, archaeologically significant sites and one paleontological site, the Messel Pit. I want to show you four examples. The first, the oldest are the caves of the Swabian Alp, which are famous for their outstanding finds from the Paleolithic period. From the so-called Hohlefels comes the oldest known representation of a woman in Germany. You can see it on the picture. It is 40,000 years old. On July the 9th in the year 2017, the six caves, Bocksteinhöhle, Hohlensteinstadel, Vogelheldhöhle, Geisenklösterle, Silkensteinhöhle, and the Hohlefels with the Venus and the Ice Age art found, they were declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the oldest mobile Ice Age works. The state archaeologists, the colleague Dr. Klaus Wolf and Professor Niklas Konrad, are in favor of a gentle approach to the new World Heritage Site. Excavation and or protecting campaigns will only be carried out with the greatest possible consideration of all risks and research questions tied to the individual action. The second example, the Roman Limes at a UNESCO, as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The lower Germanic Limes is Roman's earliest linear boundary, 7,500 kilometers long, through 20 modern states and across three continents. Its 450-year development also represents the entire range of military camps and associated civilian settlements of the Roman imperial period. At many sites in northern Germany and the Netherlands, between Remagen and Katwijk on the North Sea, their authentic ground plans can still be experienced today, as well as Rome's innovative handling of this dynamic river landscape. 
outstanding organic preservation conditions make the lower Germanic lemurs one of the most important archaeological testimonies of Roman frontiers. Since 2022, the lower Germanic lemurs has been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. For this reason, we designed a state exhibition on this topic, which was shown at five locations in the year 22 and 23. The UNESCO World Heritage Site Haithabu and Danneberg. The archaeological border complex Haithabu and Danneberg stands as a UNESCO World Heritage Site for one of the long, longest used borders in the world. The use begins in about the 5th century and extends over the expansion in the 19th century to the Nazi period. The management of this border system, which lies between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea, and includes the early medieval trading town of Haithabu, is carried out through management plan. The special circumstance is that the Dannewerk is one of the Danish national monuments, not of the German. Therefore, the establishment of the Dannewerk Museum is a particularly important building block in the valorization of the World Heritage Site. The various museum, monument, and technical objectives must be coordinated with the UNESCO. In the vicinity of the museum to be built in the next few years, the archaeological park is currently being further developed, the centerpiece of which is the gateway to the north, which has now been made accessible. And the last example, the westwork of the Karolingel Church at Corvai. The former Benedictine monastery of Corvai near Höxter in Northern Westphalia was awarded the title of World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2014. It is therefore a monument of outstanding universal value and significance for the cultural history of mankind. The 1,200-year-old Westwork from the time of Charlemagne's, the Baroque monastery complex with its imperial hall and cloister, and the princely library of the 19th century form a unique ensemble of unique charisma. Corvai is one of Germany's most important sites. The Benedictine monastery of Corvai in the territory of Saxony developed into a cultural, spiritual, and economic center in the 9th and 10th centuries. Since the transfer of the relics of St. Vitus in 836, Corvai exerted a great attraction as a place of pilgrimage. The Carolingian Abbey was considered one of the most important mediators of Christian culture in Europe. It is the oldest completely preserved Carolingian Westwork in the world. The central main room on the upper floor, surrounded on three sides by galleries, refers to ancient models for secular representative rooms with its form and original artistic decoration. Between 1945 and 1992, there were several excavations in Corvai which support the importance of the Carolingian Monastery. Carolingian masonry with oxide red brush strokes, so-called Sinopias, were uncovered in 92 in the Westwork. The frescoes there, dating in the 9th century, deceived ancient motifs from the Odyssey. Since 2019, the LWL and the LBI Arch Pro have covered over 12 hectares with ground penetrating radar and over 50 hectares using magnetometry in the Civitas. Conservations, oldest archaeological monuments in Germany. One of the most important Roman burial monuments north of the Alps is the Roman tomb in Cologne, Weiden. It is also one of the oldest ground monuments in North Rhine-Westphalia, a classic example of a very early good handling of archaeological sites and a conservation in situ. The reaction was very quick and a protective building was erected over the site by the Cologne Cathedral master builder Ernst Friedrich Zwirner. The costs were borne by the Prussian state, state to which the Rhineland belonged since 1815. It is a collapsed burial chamber designed as a dining room in Roman triclinium, which was discovered in 1843 during excavation work. The oldest protected archaeological monument in North Rhine-Westphalia is located on an important traffic axis, the Via Belgica. 
the original furnishings have been almost completely preserved. The so-called seasonal sarcophagus made of Carrara marble, imported around 300 AD, is striking. The relief shows winged victories carrying out the souls of the deceased to higher spheres. The interior also includes a Klein and armchairs for the funerary banquet. The tomb complex is dated in the late 3rd or early 4th century AD. Successful post-excavations. The Shaman of Bad Dürrenberg. An example of a successful post-excavation is the grave of Bad Dürrenberg in Saxony-Anhalt, discovered in, in 1934. It is a double burial of a Mesolithic female shaman and a six or eight month old infant. The woman lay in a squatting position. The pit was interspeared with ochre. Due to construction work, a re-excavation had to take place in 2019 after 85 years. Why is the woman called a shaman? The grave goods include skull antlers, reminiscent of antler caps of shaman in Siberia, North America, and Northern Europe. There, they are elements of costume used in ritual ceremonies to ensure the success of the hunt or identification with the animal whose power one wants to size. In addition, the grave contained jewelry made on animal teeth, five boar tusks, about 60 teeth of wild boar, deer, our ox, some pierced at the root. In addition, bone implements partly for working red chalk were found. Especially important are dorsal carapaces of three terrapines, 29 microliths and two flint lamellae in a hollowed crane bone and a stone axe. The age of the 30 or 40 year old woman is about 7,000 or 6,800 BC, according to the radiocarbon data. An RNR examination revealed dark skin color, as you can see it on the left side, dark hair, light eyes. Pathological changes were found on the front teeth in the upper jaw. The nerve cavities were partly exposed, which must have been very painful. No relationship between the woman and the child can be proven. Excavations in Germany, examples for protections. Geophysical methods help us searching archaeological sites. Magnetic protections, for instance, yielded about 50 house ground plants of the linear pottery culture near Warburg at Desenberg in North Rhine-Westphalia. Something similar was discovered in minden dankersen a hitherto unknown settlement at the northernmost periphery of the distribution area of the linear pottery culture with numerous building ground plants. Both sites have not been excavated, but can be appropriately protected by the new findings from geophysics. A mixture of research excavation and rescue excavation, the chert mine at Abensberg an Hofen. The church mine at Abensberg an Hofen in Bavaria was a decisive importance for the trade of raw materials in southern Germany and Austria from the early to the final Neolithic periods. The raw material is a striped variant of tabula chert. You can see it on the right. The early farmers used it to prepare weapons like arrowheads or tools, for example, scrapers, cycle blades, borers, or knives. In 110 hectare, we believe that there are 200 or 300,000 shafts operated in shaft technique. It's one of the biggest monuments in Bavaria. The shafts penetrated gravels and sands and were some eight meters deep at a maximum with shaft diameters usually varying from 17 centimeters to two and a half meter. Some narrow dimensions seem to imply child labor. After its discovery by Manfred Moser, the Bavarian State Office for Monument Preservation has made first rescue excavations from 84 to 86 in the last uh, century, where 55 pits have been documented, but only 15 of them were excavated. In 1998, we began with new excavation. Since that time, nearly 650 pits have been measured and documented in about 10 years. In 19 shafts, 
we found antler pigs from the calm culture between 3,522 and 2,896 calibrated BC. The radiocarbon dates from charcoal ranges older from 5,600 to 2,900 BC, also from the linear pottery culture to the bell baker culture. From each shaft, you can get between 43 to 167 kilogram usable chert. Flint mining and tool production is not well organized by a society. There was no profit thinking or motive during the early agricultural periods around 6,000 years ago. And we don't believe that there were specialists for both mining and tool production. The distribution of chert from Amsberg and Hofen did not result from proposed for trade, but from handing down between individuals. It was based on hand-to-hand -hand exchange. Now I want to show you an um, example of a robbery excavation, one of the most important in Germany, the disk at Nebra. One of the most spectacular, spectacular robbery excavations and at the same time a find of the century of the last years was discovered in 97-98 by robbery excavators with metal detector in Saxony-Anhalt near Nebra. In 1999, the find complex was offered to sale to the Museum of Prehistory and Early History in Berlin for 1 million German marks. In 2001, the state archaeologist Harald Meller heard about it. Saxony-Anhalt has a treasure law. According to paragraph 12 of the law, movable cultural monuments of outstanding scientific value become the property of the state upon discovery. The legal owner was therefore the state of Saxony-Anhalt from the very beginning. The handover and arrest of the robbery excavators resembles a detective story which ends in the Basel Hotel in February 2002. The fine complex includes a bronze disc with gold overlays, two swords with gold grip claps, two rim axes, a buckling rim chisel and remains of two arm spirals. Since a funerary architecture is missing, a deliberate deposition can be assumed. The early Bronze Age cast and then hammered out disc dates from around 1600 before Christ. It has a diameter of about 33 centimeter and a weight of about a little bit more than two kilograms. There are 83 small holes on the rim. The disc is inlaid. A total of 37 gold plates with 0.4 millimeter thickness have been inserted into the bronze disc. A multiple reworking of the representation is secured. Striking is the representation of the celestial phenomena with sun, moons and stars, including the Pleiades. The stars are around 1600 before Christ in the vernal equinox. That means they were invisible at the beginning of spring because congruent with the sun. In contrast, they were most visible in autumn. Therefore, the disc is suitable for the determination of the season. According to today's calendar, the rural year begins on March the 10th and ends on October the 17th. Both marginal arcs probably represent horizon symbols and thus calendrical dates marking the annual course of the sun along the horizon line at sunrise and sunset between June 21 and December 21. The third arc, uh, arc at the bottom is interpreted, interpreted as a ship representation. Now I want to show you random finds, the urn from Givlinghausen, Southern Westphalia. Often it is simply left to chance to find an archaeological object. Among the accidentally discovered finds is the urn from Gevlinghausen found in 1961 during construction work on a septic tank. The 37 centimeters high bronze amphora contained the cremated bones of a 20 or 40 year old man. The unique find dates the light, late Bronze Age or early Iron Age approximately between 770 and 400 before Christ. The vessel, probably made in Northern Europe, is marked with over 10,000 impressions. Several bird sunbursts attest to central religious motives. 
The find complex also includes two bone plates decorated with circular eyes, presumably game pieces or oracle sticks. Excavations in Germany, which means mostly rescue excavations. Often it is simply left to chance, uh, the number of regular excavations varies in the individual federal states. In Westphalia Lippe alone, we carried out just under 250 excavations last year. In the Rhineland, there were about 350. The specialist offices can no longer carry out the large number of excavations themselves. A separate market has developed for freelance archaeologists. Excavation companies have taken over the business and carry out excavations under the control of the officers and the excavation guidelines. The Association of State Archaeologists in the Federal Republic of Germany estimates that about 5,000 excavations are carried out annually by the specialized officers and excavation companies. Another theme which we have had today was metal detectoring, but now in Germany. Bavaria is currently trying to prohibit the use of metal detectors in general by means of a new law for the protection of historical monuments. Other states deal with it differently. In most states, you need a license to search and recover fines. This is also the case in North Rhine-Westphalia. Often, colleagues try to establish a good relationship with detectorists so that the fines are reported which is a prerequisite for comprehensive research. Let's not kind ourselves. Whether legal or illegal, tracking archaeological finds with metal detectors has long since become a hobby that is getting out of hand, and archaeologists have to try to regulate this. Underwater archaeology, the importance of the 2001 UNESCO Convention. Underwater archaeology is a vital part of archaeological research and deals with sources that are constantly submerged in water or lie in waterlogged soil and are thus conserved by water. Due to the variety of cultural landscapes in Germany, underwater archaeology plays a major role, but only in some regions, whilst in others it is relatively insignificant. Although rivers do exist in all federal states, and all the authorities do indeed carry out in investigations in rivers, the larger lakes and coastal regions are very unevenly distributed throughout Federal Republic of Germany. Underwater archaeology is important because of the unique preservation conditions with finds and features being deposited for centuries underwater where they are not exposed to the air. It is these excellent preservation conditions that allow us to gain comprehensive insight into the cultural and environmental history of prehistoric and historical periods. In order to concentrate the efforts to represent the interests of underwater archaeological research in Germany, the Association of State Archaeologists found a commission of underwater archaeology in 1993 consisting of experts with relevant experience in the field of lacustrine and marine archaeology, the Commission oversees the coastal and inland waters that contain significant amounts of finds. The Association of State Archaeologists expressly welcomes the UNESCO Convention and the Association of the Federal Republic of Germany is of great significance for German archaeological research. The protection of our cultural heritage must not stop at our borders. As an archaeologist, one cannot but regret the fact that the Federal Republic of Germany has not yet signed the Convention on the Protection of Underwater cult Cultural Heritage until today. Politicians should find the courage to rectify this as soon as possible. Thousands of shipwrecks, as well as numerous hunting and settlement remains, still lie at the bottom of the sea protected by water. The potential threats are varied. Economic factors such as the extraction of sand and gravel, traffic and tourism, the production of oil and gas, offshore wind power plants and treasure hunters. Outside of the 12-mile zone, the monument protection laws are powerless. 
Now I give you an example from the North Frisian Wadden Sea. The North Frisian Wadden Sea Archaeological Excavation Reserve was established in 1973. It is located in a geomorphically dynamical natural area and is now part of the UNESCO World Heritage Wadden Sea. Hidden in the tidal flats and exposed to the current of the tides, relics of submerged cultural landscapes as well as shipping can be found. By means of geophysical, geoarchaeological, and archaeological investigations, the surroundings of the trading post of Rungholt, as well as other investigations areas, are to be opened up. Cultural landscape can now be recorded, surveyed, and documented. Archaeologic, archaeology of the modern age. In general, archaeologists investigate the material legacies of human beings. Since archaeology knows no time limit, the period from the beginning of industrialism to the, rep to the present is researched in a global historical perspective within the framework of the, archaeological, of the archaeology of modernity. It has thus become an integral part of the preservation of archaeological monuments. For the day-to-day -day archaeological preservation of monuments, this presupposes a setting of priorities by the specialized offices in the countries. In addition, interdisciplinary networking is necessary. Monument protection laws in the countries and international conventions provide the legal framework for the preservation of archaeological monuments. In the spirit of the 92 Valletta Convention, several monument protection laws in the Federal Republic of Germany state say all remains and objects, as well as all other traces of man from past epochs whose preservation and examination contribute to tracing the history of man and his relationship to the natural environment are to be considered archaeological heritage and thus worthy of protection. For this reason, the German Association for Archaeology drew up guidelines on modern archaeological in 2017. A particularly impressive but also harrowing example of the strange way history is dealt with during the Second World War comes from South Westphalia, where incredible war crimes were committed in the last days of the war in March 1945 in the Arnsberg Forest in Sauerland. Since 2018, the sites have been under archaeological investigation. Historical records and archaeological excavation results are used to reconstruct the course of events. At the shooting site in the Langenbach Valley, south of Barstein, the personal belongings of the victims buried in the forest floor were recovered in 2018. Presumably on March the 20th in the year 1945, 208 forced laborers and children were brut brutally executed at three locations near Warstein and Meschede. 71 victims alone were shot in the Langenbach Valley and buried, including their belongings. At the end of April 1945, the bodies were exhumed on behalf of the US forces. You can see it in the picture. They were buried 300 meters away in the Provisional Victims Cemetery at Melkeplätzchen, south of Warstein, and a memorial was erected. A stone obelisk with red Soviet on the top, a weather fane, hammer and cycle, and the Cyrillic letters CCCP. An inscription in German, English, and Russian referred to the bestial murder of Russian citizens at the end of the war. But in 1964, the exhumation of the dead and the burial took place on a new cemetery from the First World War in Meschede. The translocated obelisk from Warstein also came here, but was obviously no longer erected. The reason lies in the not desired coming to terms with the past. Apparently, the Soviet emblems and the reference to the German murderers Deeds distributed the spirit of the time during the Cold War. One did not want to preserve the memorial and simply disposed of it. Particularly explosive is the fact that parts of the inscription have been removed. The paragraph, bestially murdered, 
was gouged out in the sense of a classic damnatio memoria. memoria. What an in unbelievable way of dealing with local history. One of the most recent examples of modernist archaeology comes from the Cold War area, a Soviet agent radio from Elsdorf, Heppendorf. During excavations in the Hambach open pit, a prawn in the Rhineland, a buried Soviet agent radio was recently discovered in a pit five meters away from a small forest path. A green aluminum container contained all the equipment necessary for sparking. Even the hissing escape of air when the vacuum packing was first opened pfft, revealed that the equipment had never been used. Everything in the box was carefully wrapped in packing paper or originally sealed. It was a factory fresh radio. Handwritten positions designations in Russian were found on the wrapping paper. The shortwave radio has a range up to 1,200 kilometers. Parallels were used by Warsaw Pact countries starting around 1984, and the device was manufactured in November 1987. But how and why did a Soviet radio end up in the Rhineland? By whom was the agent radio concealed? Only intelligence services come into question. The Soviet Russian Army Intelligence Service, Glavonye Razvedut Vatelnoye Upravlenie. A radio message from the immediate vicinity would have reached the Warsaw Pact states more quickly than the warheads because of the radio's long range and would have made a nuclear counter-strike possible. The agent radios were used only in extreme cases of tension because of the high risk of detection. Due to the pre previous lack of corresponding other archaeological evidence, the spy radio is an important ground find that proves the deep penetration of West German society with agents of the Warsaw States. Another example, a very sad example, thefts. Thefts from museum and collections are unfortunately no longer a rarity. Unscrupulously well-prepared contract thefts are carried out even in well-secured houses, the munching gold treasure. In the night from November 21 to 22, last year, 2022, Previously unknown preparators broke into the Celtic Roman Museum in Manching, Bavaria. The thieves stole a hoard of 483 Celtic gold coins dating from around 100 before Christ. Since the perpetrators cut fiber optic cables in the vicinity before breaking into the museum, the alarm system could not function as intended. In 1999, during excavations south of the ancient harbor of the Celtic city of Manching, a gold treasure was discovered that had been carried out about 100 BC and contained 483 so-called starters. This brings the total weight to about 3.7 kilograms gold. The theft of the Celtic gold treasure from Manching threatens not only the permanent loss of an absolute highlight of the Kelten Römer Museum Manching, but also one of the largest and most important gold treasures of the Celtic period ever. The cultural and scientific damage is enormous and cannot be replaced. How can we protect ourselves from such thefts in the future? Should, can, and may such valuable origins still be exhibited publicly at all? Another theme, mediations. In the Federal Republic of Germany, we try very hard to communicate our archaeological findings to a broad audience. We have heard some examples from France some minutes ago. This works best in archaeological museums. I show you here an example from our Roman Museum in Halton, Westphalia. We have reconstructed part of a wooden and wood and earth wall of the main Roman camp with a west gate. In a newly built guardhouse, there is now an escape room. The Roman days 
held every two years, are always very well attended. Last year, we have had 11,000 visitors over two days. The many publications in Germany, which often have a popular scientific orientation, such as the annual reports of the state archaeologies, are also part of the mediation. The Association of State Archaeologists in the Federal Republic of Germany is also involved internationally. For example, in the International Council of Monuments and Museum Sites, ICOMOS, and in the European Archaeological Sound Council, EAC, whose last meeting in Bonn was hosted by us. You have seen it in the picture from the colleague. I hope I have been able to give you an understanding of some representative aspects of the German state archaeologies. The future tasks are manifold. Above all, the changes in the laws in the wake of rene renewable energies and an associated new focus will keep us on our toes. But we continue to engage ourselves with all means. To paraphrase the words of a colleague, the nose in the dirt, in the eyes, the shine of the history. Thanks for the attention. Bueno, voy a comenzar la exposición de la arqueología profesional en España, los colegios profesionales y el Consejo General. Es una ponencia que leo yo, pero que estará más amplia en las actas posteriores que firmaremos con el resto de compañeros, Rafael Turati, Yolanda Lamar, Mari Carmen García Cabezudo, Carlos Cortés y Silvia Carmona, que completaremos este, pero ahora voy a hacer una breve exposición. Primero eh, voy a hacer un, un marco eh, para, como ya se ha tratado en varios puntos, de qué es lo que llamamos patrimonio arqueológico. Eh, la evolución de, del pensamiento sobre el patrimonio arqueológico ha sufrido profundos cambios y precisiones en cuanto a lo que entendemos por este patrimonio desde la antigüedad clásica hasta la edad moderna ha existido el concepto exclusivamente de, del tesoro, concepto que continuó en la legislación española hasta comienzo del siglo XX. Tesoros eran los bienes que se conservaban en los templos clásicos ofrecidos a los dioses. Es el conjunto de bienes y joyas que los faraones, los reyes o fruto de las conquistas se conservan. Es también el conjunto de bienes y reliquias que la Iglesia ha guardado como sus bienes más preciados. Aquí vemos como la evolución de este concepto de, desde un metal precioso a un valor simbol, simbólico, como es el caso de las astillas de la Santa Cruz o, o de huesos o sangre de santos, eh, alcanza un valor simbólico, pero también tiene un valor económico y de prestigio. De hecho, los centros religiosos que atesoran mayor número de reliquias, generan beneficios por ser centros de peregrinaje y lugar de donaciones más importantes. Vemos cómo el puro valor material se le ha añadido el valor simbólico. En este sentido, gracias a ello, se han conservado eh, monumentos como la columna de Trajano o los obeliscos egipcios, que se han conservado a través de los siglos por su carga de significado y prestigio. Las siete maravillas del universo son el primer repertorio de bienes del patrimonio mundial y valorados por la antigüedad, reconociendo que son obras de genio humano que sobresale del resto de las manifestaciones. Pero tenemos que llegar al siglo XVIII para que en algunos países europeos se creen responsables de la conservación del patrimonio construido con criterios monumentales y artísticos como sucedió en Austria. Sin embargo, tenemos que llegar a la Revolución Francesa para alcanzar la generalización del concepto de patrimonio histórico artístico como patrimonio del pueblo y patrimonio colectivo de toda una comunidad. En el siglo XVI es el primero que tenemos noticias de personajes que están directamente interesados en los tesoros arqueológicos. 
en Aragón he estudiado a personajes como Vicencio Juan de la Estanosa, que posteriormente haré una comunicación sobre este personaje que, estuvo, que creó el primer museo eh, de, de materiales arqueológicos, paleontológicos y medallas en 1645. Este eh, coleccionaba materiales arqueológicos y compartía sus conocimientos con otros mecenas como el conde de Guimerá, de 1584, o con José Nicolás de Azara, que hablaré de él también, eh, que falleció en 1804 y fue embajador de España en Roma y que contribuyó económicamente a excavaciones en Pompeya, eh, obteniendo grandes eh, cantidad de materiales que afortunadamente regaló al rey Carlos III y que ahora están conservados en las colecciones reales y en el Museo del Prado. También coincidió con José Roque Joaquín de Alcubierre, que dirigió las excavaciones de Pompeya por encargo del Borbón en 1748. Pero tenemos que llegar a 1897 para que se cree el cuerpo de facultativos de archiveros, bibliotecarios y arqueólogos, que ahora ha desaparecido el de arqueólogos. Y al decreto, Real Decreto de 1 de marzo de 1912, en el que se publica el reglamento para la realización de excavaciones artísticas y científicas y la conservación de las ruinas y antigüedades, en el que se reserva al Estado la titularidad de los bienes arqueológicos. Eh, se constituye en 1939 la Comisaría General de Excavaciones Arqueológicas, <coughs> creándose los comisarios provinciales. El, el, estos comisarios eran potestativos del director general de Beas Artes, que entre las personas que decía que eran debidamente capacitadas y afines al régimen. En 1955 se modificó este panorama creándose el Servicio General de Bellas Artes, que estaba constituido, constituido por un catedrático de Arqueología, Prehistoria o Historia del Arte, que actuaría como inspector general y contaría con delegaciones arqueológicas en los distintos distritos universitarios. Los delegados de zona eran elegidos entre catedráticos de asignaturas afines. Este esquema subsiste hasta 1968, en el que se nombran, por la Dirección General de Bellas Artes, delegados provinciales. Este estado de cosas continúa hasta la llegada de la democracia casi, aunque hay algunas excepciones... Eh, como se, se crea para mayor confusión desde la Dirección General de Bellas Artes el programa llamado Misión Rescate que premiaba a los equipos formados por maestros de escuela que con sus alumnos realizaban descubrimientos de yacimientos y de los materiales arqueológicos y por estos materiales recibían diversos premios a los colegios, que esta situación ocasionó un gran destrozo en el patrimonio arqueológico. También el Frente de Juventudes eh, colaboraba en las excavaciones arqueológicas, a veces eh, participando sus miembros en las propias excavaciones y otras como apoyo, ya que financiaban las cocinas que alimentaban a los arqueólogos con cocineros profesionales. Con la llegada de la democracia, y la Constitución, con su, que, que en su artículo 46 recoge que los poderes públicos garantizarán la conservación y promoverán el enriquecimiento del patrimonio histórico, cultural y artístico de los pueblos de España y de los bienes que lo integran, eh, es cuando hay un una gran cambio en este tema. Mientras que en otros países, como Francia, los aficionados... Eh, se integraban en equipos profesionales de arqueología, en las, sobre todo en las excavaciones de, de verano, con los arqueólogos benevol, los de carácter voluntario. En España se restringía totalmente la colaboración de aficionados y solamente se restringía a las excavaciones de verano por la universidad de los alumnos seleccionados. Eh, tenemos que hablar... De, bueno, como vamos con el tiempo muy ajustado, eh, vamos a, a ir abreviando. Eh, 
sobre la situación actual de la intervención sobre el patrimonio arqueológico. Estas son las intervenciones bueno, es de voluntarios. Yo mismo creé una asociación de, de aficionados a la arqueología y cuando este es el, el yacimiento de Contrevia Velaisca, que se anunció en la prensa que se iba a destruir, y entonces escribimos a, al, ya, al municipio para decirles que, que si querían la colaboración de un grupo de aficionados, y nos contestó el alcalde con faltas de ortografía en la redacción, que nos decía que, por supuesto, que nos agradecía nuestra participación en el salvamento de los monumentos. Los aficionados en España no tenían ninguna participación. Esta es la primera excavación que hizo Miguel Beltrán en el Cabezo de Alcalá de Azaila y nosotros nos ofrecimos también para colaborar y bueno, nos tenían exclusivamente pues, labores de, de limpieza, acompañamiento y prospección, que entonces la prospección se consideraba a una actividad eh, marginal y con bueno, una discriminación total. Mientras que en Francia, aquí es la primera excavación científica que participé fue en la Agro de la Saguet en, en, en Niza y con el profesor Henri de Lemli, donde participaban, eh, estuvimos 66 personas de multitud de países de todo el mundo y donde eh, primero, esto fue en 1970 y 1971, eh, las primeras dos horas eran de clases teóricas, prácticas, sobre la metodología de excavación y la tipología, y el resto del día era de excavaciones arqueológicas. La verdad que en aquellos tiempos, en 1970, en, en la Universidad de Marsella, todos los datos arqueológicos diariamente se mandaban a la universidad y se introducían en un ordenador que ocupaba una habitación entera y se metían las coordenadas cartesianas de todas las piezas para realizar la estratigrafía, mientras que aquí desde luego estábamos mucho más lejos de esta situación. Eh, en la actualidad en nuestro país eh, se, ha crea, se han creado equipos inter, interdisciplinares contando con arquitectos también los equipos que resuelvan los problemas estructurales y de interpretación de las soluciones arquitectónicas en los yacimientos arqueológicos. Eh, también participan, como se ha comentado, conservadores, restauradores, físicos, químicos, geólogos, etc. Aunque no está en nuestro país regulado, de manera que eh, se da la circunstancia de que se realizan excavaciones de necrópolis en las que no está presente ningún antropólogo en, durante el periodo de excavación. El, las grandes innovaciones del pensamiento actual son el integrar el concepto de sostenibilidad y de función social del patrimonio. El artículo 46 de la Constitución establece que los poderes públicos están obligados a intervenir para garantizar la conservación y promover el, el enriquecimiento del patrimonio histórico, cultural y artístico de los pueblos de España, así como de los bienes materiales que lo integran. Y establece el reparto competencial, la concurrencia, pero que, por supuesto, el Estado, yo creo que tiene que tener todavía un peso importante y alcanzar acuerdos como el Plan Nacional de Arqueología intenta construir. En 1985 se aprueba la Ley de Patrimonio Histórico Español, que es un referente importantísimo, que supuso un avance, eh, recoge las competencias administrativas y la cesión de autorizaciones arqueológicas y el carácter de bienes de maniales de los restos arqueológicos. Pero hay que recordar que, que uno de la, los problemas que hemos tenido en los juicios que ha habido contra clandestinos eh, con el tema de los yacimientos arqueológicos es que aducen, eh, que desconocen que es un yacimiento arqueológico. Por eso no solamente tiene que haber una inscripción de los yacimientos en un registro público, sino que además deberían de estar señalizados. Debemos de perder el miedo a que los clandestinos conozcan los yacimientos, que en general los conocen mejor que nosotros, que los profesionales, 
sino que lo que tenemos que hacer es una labor de protección y de, de conocimiento de los mismos. Eh, esta nueva situación supuso el pasar de los escasos cientos de excavaciones arqueológicas que se realizaban en España antes de la llegada de la democracia, que eran dirigidas por profesores universitarios y con alumnos en prácticas, a las decenas de miles que se realizan en todo el territorio español desde ese momento. Además, con la llegada de la democracia, pues, eh, hubo un, un acceso directo de licenciados de arqueología a la, a la Dirección de Excavaciones Arqueológicas eh, sin ningún requisito, de manera que pues, eh, posteriormente se ha exigido por muchas comunidades no solamente la titulación, que siempre se ha exigido, pero también una experiencia eh, comprobada en, en el tema de excavación. Pero falta, como hemos comentado, el regular bien eh, estos criterios. Se ha pasado pues, a, a ser el, el del licenciado en cualquier rama de, de historias y que contara con experiencia de haber participado en excavaciones arqueológicas. El despegue de la arqueología preventiva vino sobre todo por la directiva de la Unión Europea, el Real Decreto Legislativo de Evaluación del Impacto Medioambiental, en el que se exigía el que hubiera un, un estudio de impacto y la calidad de estos estudios pues están en manos, desde luego, de la Administración, que es quien debe de velar por la, porque, por la calidad de los informes que presentan los técnicos. La explosión de obras públicas en España motivó no solo que se multiplicaran las intervenciones, sino que se crearon también cientos de empresas que, que pudieran asumir proyectos de, de, con presupuestos multimillonarios. El desarrollo urbanístico también supuso uno de los motores de desarrollo eh, incontrolado del sector. Eh, como he indicado, se pasó de centenares de personas dedicados a la arqueología a varios miles. En un principio se llegó a calcular que se estaba, había unos 3.000 personas, pero con la llegada de la crisis del 2008 hay un descenso que en la actualidad aunque no contamos con herramientas adecuadas, solamente contamos con las cifras de arqueólogos colegiados, pero hay muchos arqueólogos que, que no lo están, pero podemos valorar sobre el, el millar de, de arqueólogos que, profesionales. En cuanto a la arqueología profesional, bueno, como he dicho, los colegios han jugado un papel fundamental. Eh, en 1978 se crea en Cataluña la Asamblea de Arqueólogos de Cataluña y en 1983 se crea en Madrid la Asociación Profesional de Arqueólogos, aunque en este caso está nutrida exclusivamente por profesores universitarios. En Cataluña se crea la, la Comisión de Patrimonio en el seno del Colegio de Doctores y Licenciados en Filosofía y Letras y en Ciencias de Cataluña en 1984 y se crean y se editan la, las primeras jornadas sobre la situación de la profesión de la arqueología. Después se hace otra reunión de ese carácter eh, nacional en León y en 1990 se decide, la mayor parte de los profesionales, seguir la, la línea de constituirnos en secciones de arqueología dentro de los colegios profesionales. Así se crea primero el Colegio de Madrid y el mismo año el Colegio de, de Aragón. En 1992 se crean secciones de arqueología en la mayor parte de los colegios profesionales de España, en Castilla y León, Alicante, Sevilla, etc. Debemos matizar que en el proceso arqueológico intervienen diversos niveles profesionales que en algunos países están bien estratificados, pero no así en, en nuestro país, de manera que gran parte de las quejas que tenemos por nuestros profesionales es que en las excavaciones se contratan licenciados o, o, o titulados en grado en arqueología y después hacen, se les eh, realizan trabajos de, de obreros especializados. El director de las intervenciones muchas veces 
eh, colegiada con un equipo directivo integrado por arquitectos, ingenieros. Eh, en otros países, como digo, como en Francia, hay especializaciones que están tipificadas de antropólogos, zoarqueólogos, especialistas en plantas, geólogos, topógrafos. Aquí se, debe, se habla de crear un equipo, pero no, no está regulado la presencia. En, desde el 2006, desde el Consejo General de Colegios Profesionales, que es el, el órgano de representación de todos los colegios, eh, se crea, bueno, se crea en el, en el 2008 dentro, eh, un, una, dentro del Consejo desarrollar en el programa de, del Consejo General desarrollar la profesión de arqueólogos se trata de una, de una profesión que, que se crea nueva en realidad con, que completa la, la tradicional de los colegios de educadores eh, que es la, la única que había y que ahora eh, nos comprometemos a desarrollar. Se aprueba en el 2014 la Comisión redactora de un código deontológico, que es una de las condiciones que tienen los colegios, exclusiva, la redacción de códigos deontológicos. Hasta ahora también los colegios tenían, bueno, aquí en, en el colegio de, de Asturias, antiguamente era, se, se organizaban unos premios nacionales de arqueología en el que nos invitaron algún año a participar. Ahora los colegios hemos perdido esa esa buena costumbre. Las secciones de, de arqueología eh, empezamos a reunirnos eh, como secciones, simplemente. La primera reunión fue en Madrid, la segunda fue en Zaragoza. Eh, posteriormente tuvimos reuniones en diversas provincias, en Madrid, fundamentalmente en Palma de Mallorca. Bueno, estuvimos recorriendo toda España y la verdad que, que fue una manera... De, de conocernos y, y de confirmar la problemática general que teníamos todos los colegios. Y finalmente, eh, bueno, estaba hablando de, del código deontológico, la comisión que se creó en 2014, presidida por, por el especialista Felipe Criado Boado y con la doctora Silvia Carmona, decana del Colegio de Córdoba, y por mí mismo, pues al final se aprobó el código en el Pleno del Consejo General el 28 de noviembre del 2014. Otro de los objetivos que, tenía, que teníamos en el Consejo era la de, de contar con un Congreso Nacional de Arqueología. Por ese motivo, en el 2017 se estableció el, el, primer, el primer Congreso Nacional de Arqueología, que el primero fue en Zaragoza y tuvo un, un éxito de de acogida y de presentación de comunicaciones. Como he dicho, hubo más de, de 100 participantes y más de 60 comunicaciones. Teníamos previsto otro en el 19, que fueran bianuales, pero por motivo de la pandemia tuvo que retrasarse hasta el 2021 y fue un, un congreso online, aunque hubo algunas eh, presenciales y estuvo... Bueno, la, una de, la, de las tesis principales fue de, eh, bueno, tuvo, Harris estuvo presente en el Congreso con una comunicación muy interesante. En la actualidad la profesión ha pasado del boom inmobiliario y de obras públicas al colapso, como he indicado antes, de la construcción y de la situación económica que supuso que las obras públicas en España pues, materialmente se redujeran al mínimo. Después también hemos tenido el problema que está sin resolver de las, de las directrices europeas de la ley de contratos, que nos ha contado nuestro colega francés de que eh, prima la, la baja en las, en las contrataciones, aunque ahí nos ha comentado que la administración valora también los equipos. Aquí en España, desgraciadamente, pues, eh, valo, solamente se valora la baja económica, de manera que... Eh, es, es uno de los graves problemas que tenemos eh, porque bueno, bueno, los, los presupuestos más bajos pues van acompañados con un, un nivel 
eh, de calidad también por debajo de, del que se debería de establecer como mínimo. Esta visión cortoplacista de muchos profesionales ha reducido también, ha, ha actuado en contra de nuestros intereses, re, eh, reduciendo las expectativas de remuneración y llevando la profesión a una mera supervivencia en muchos casos. A esto se ha añadido la función supervisora de la Administración, que ha rebajado los estándares de calidad y reducido los niveles de control, también por cuestiones económicas, presionadas también por los agentes económicos y por la reducción de, de profesionales que desempeñan las labores de inspección y valoración de las memorias y expedientes, que en algunos casos, ahora por ejemplo estamos con un boom de las, eh, los trabajos sobre las energías renovables que llegan a las direcciones generales de manera masiva y que no, no dan abasto las administraciones a hacer una evaluación pues, adecuada de las necesidades de de realizar sondeos, prospecciones y estudios. Esto ha conducido a una reducción de la calidad de los trabajos y una falta de publicación de los mismos y de las labores de divulgación. Debemos llegar a, a un consenso social por parte, además, de todos los partidos políticos en donde el valor del patrimonio arqueológico se ha reconocido como un bien para todos. La Unión Europea debe también reflexionar sobre la importancia de valorar la historia común y comenzar a legislar para intentar converger las diferentes visiones existentes en los Estados miembros y que existan unos estándares homologados de obligado cumplimiento. A pesar de esta visión pesimista, eh, ve una mejora en la profesión de, de la arqueología. Contamos con titulaciones universitarias, contamos con profesionales en todos los niveles de la administración. Existen empresas de arqueología y de arqueólogos formados que forman parte de gabinetes interdisciplinares de medio ambiente, en ingenierías y contamos con, con congresos nacionales y con un código deontológico. Nos falta que la administración central reconozca la necesidad de que sea esta una profesión regulada al ser profesionales que actúan sobre bienes de derecho público, de titularidad de todos los españoles y que debe haber una regulación normativa de los profesionales que actúan sobre estos bienes. Es necesario contribuir a crear un, un lobby europeo para desarrollar políticas convergentes de protección del patrimonio arqueológico que completen los tratados europeos, consolidando la tradición del derecho romano y de los países mediterráneos. España debe ser un, un adalid en esta lucha contra el tráfico de bienes arqueológicos y de obras de arte, que además es un país que, que lo ha sufrido de manera especial y que todavía no ha firmado, no ha subrayado el último convenio sobre el espolio. También debemos insistir en la necesidad de contar con una auténtica ley del mecenazgo que sea realmente operativa. Hemos en, hablado fundamentalmente de excavaciones arqueológicas, y esta es la base de la profesión arqueológica, pero también la, la arqueología contempla otras labores como la investigación, la musealización, la difusión del patrimonio, la interpretación del patrimonio, la formación permanente y esas necesidades formativas que desde el colegio y desde el consejo esperamos poder ir cubriendo. Aparecen nuevas tecnologías continuamente que debemos de incorporar a nuestro acervo profesional. En conclusiones, el proyecto de consolidación y restauración de los yacimientos debe incluirse en todas las intervenciones y debe, debe llevarse a cabo conjuntamente durante la excavación. Las administraciones competentes deben ser las garantes de que se apliquen los principios y metodologías reconocidas por profesionales con experiencia en el patrimonio arqueológico, con criterios objetivos tanto para las intervenciones directas de las propias administraciones como en las de todos los integrantes en el proceso de intervención. La administración no debe de ser timorata, inmovilista y el criterio de enterrar yacimientos para evitar su desarrollo, su deterioro, perdón, sino que debe de asumir el mandato constitucional de poner al servicio de la población 
este legado de nuestros antepasados. También debe de ser claro en que cuando se realiza una intervención arqueológica y aparece unos niveles arqueológicos importantes, a pesar de que eh, a lo mejor no alcancen la cota eh, que el proyecto contempla de intervención, pues no se debe de impedir el realizar una investigación eh, necesaria para conocer ese yacimiento relevante. Debemos de contar con un estatuto del arqueólogo. Tenemos que garantizar desde el Consejo General una formación permanente de los arqueólogos con acreditación que nos habilite para el ejercicio profesional. Es necesario homologar los procedimientos SEC técnicos que seguimos en todas las comunidades que sean aplicables para todos. La presencia de arqueólogos en los diferentes niveles de toma de decisión es imprescindible. Es también un medio de disfrute a través del conocimiento de la realidad de las culturas que nos han precedido y que nos muestran la unidad de la especie humana y la riqueza de la cultura de los pueblos que lo integran. Es necesario establecer procedimientos informáticos para documentar los materiales procedentes de excavaciones susceptibles de modificación durante la fase de estudio, pero con depósito en los museos correspondientes. Hay que establecer lugares de depósito de materiales que cuenten con las garantías de conservación y protección adecuadas. En la actualidad, los arqueólogos muchas veces tenemos en nuestros propios domicilios durante todo el año eh, materiales arqueológicos sin las debidas condiciones. Debemos de generalizar y obligar a que se cuente con planes de prevención de riesgos de, en todas las intervenciones arqueológicas. En la actualidad, algunas comunidades exigen también que existan seguros de responsabilidad civil en las intervenciones arqueológicas y en otras comunidades no se exige nada y no se cumple. Debemos garantizar que los restos arqueológicos no salgan de España sin las debidas garantías de conservación y de devolución, responsabilizándose las administraciones de ser ágiles en estos procedimientos administrativos. Debemos asegurar la competencia de los profesionales del equipo de intervención arqueológica y su obligada presencia de especialistas de fauna, restauración, antropología, etc. La Administración debe de actualizarse de, del, mismo, del mismo modo, facilitando el acceso a las cartas arqueológicas fiables, a la documentación de expedientes por una intervención, a la consulta de material de archivos y museos, que no todos los museos en la actualidad están dotados de medios para poder realizar los estudios científicos adecuados. Debemos de actualizar también, por nuestra parte, el código deontológico, incluyendo los temas de memoria democrática, de antropología física y del espolio de las cartas últimas que han aparecido y su relación con museos. Es preciso que, eh, que lleguemos a un acuerdo de rebajar el IVA en materia de patrimonio arqueológico ya que al, al ser un bien de manial, eh, su aumento no entraña aumento de beneficio para el sujeto pasivo. El particular que realiza una obra civil eh, es el pagano, encuentra restos arqueológicos, debe sufragar el costo de la excavación, el lavado, siglado y depósito en el museo. Pero eh, lo que no es justo es que se le repercuta el 21% del IVA cuando no tiene ningún beneficio de estas intervenciones y encarece eh, el valor de, de las intervenciones arqueológicas. Para valorar el impacto de los profesionales se utilizan indicadores económicos que precisan eh, manejar el código profesional, en nuestro caso el del Instituto Nacional de Estadística, que no define un código exclusivo para arqueólogos, sino que es un genérico que engloba varias profesiones que nada tienen en común con la nuestra. Es necesario individualizar y definir perfectamente este código profesional y contar con un descriptor que además nos ayude en los casos de enfermedades profesionales que ahora no se reconocen a la profesión de arqueólogo y que existen. De manera que, eh, una vez que contemos con este código, tenemos que también reconocer las enfermedades profesionales eh, para poder eh, 
acogernos a ellas. En fin, como habéis visto, he sido muy rápido, pero tenemos un largo camino que recorrer y seguro que pues, todos ustedes tendrán muchas cosas que aportar todavía. Muchas gracias. José Ignacio Lorenzo. Sí. Hay un, hay un protocolo, el, el protocolo de Minnesota de firmado en 1991. ¿Minnesota? Protocolo de Minnesota. No, pero también en España también. 1991, creo recordar. Pero también en, en España hay un, un reglamento de desarrollo de la ley en la que también hay unas indicaciones de que lo primero que dice y, y es lo único que, que conseguimos sacar los arqueólogos es que la exhumación perdón, sí, gracias las exhumaciones de, de memoria democrática las, las deben de hacer arqueólogos profesionales, ese fue un, un logro porque hasta ahora las intervenciones de fosas pues las hacían asociaciones de víctimas que por supuesto no siempre contaban y además que la dirección facultativa es de arqueólogos contando eh, con con las direcciones generales de patrimonio cultural correspondiente de las comunidades autónomas. Es decir, que la metodología es la misma. De todos modos, sí que faltaría por desarrollar eh, el, el tratamiento diferente, como ha comentado esta mañana nuestro compañero Ángel Villa, eh, faltaría eh, definir el tratamiento que hay con los familiares eh, de las víctimas, porque una excavación no es un lugar... Tendría que ser un lugar accesible, facilitarles el acceso a los familiares a una excavación antropológica. Debería, hay que tener en cuenta también que los materiales arqueológicos, una vez que se termina la excavación, se entregan a los familiares, no, no van, solamente se entregan en los museos cuando no hay familiares que los reclamen. Los, los restos humanos identificados eh, se entregan a los familiares. Entonces, ellos les dan sepultura donde ellos deciden. Eso es lo que dice la Ley de Memoria Democrática de Española. No, no, ahora le termino dale, el dale el micro que no oigo nada. Pero todo esto se habla también en la Constitución de, del 78 o eso es más adelante? Porque no la de memoria democrática es de hace unos cuantos años, pero en el 78 no se habla nada de eso, se obvia, ¿no? Es una pregunta mía que quería, saber, quería preguntar. Sí. Eh, ahora no recuerdo, sabéis que, que, es, que ha habido en esta legislatura. Eh, ha habido un, un cambio de, de normativa. Ahora hay una. Ahora no, no recuerdo la, la fecha. No, pues, ya habla en, la, en, la, en el 78. No, no, pero en esto el 78 no es. 78 nada. No, no. Del... No va a aparecer en el 78. No, no, claro. pero sí. Es que la... Un amigo mío me dijo que. Uf. Sí, yo digo, yo creo que no, pero vamos, que tú te has leído la Constitución medio dormido. Por, no sé, era solo una cuestión porque se me había quedado en mi cabeza. Y claro, como no me he leído la Constitución entera. Pues tenía esa duda. O sea, que es un poco tonto, pero solo quería preguntártelo, por si acaso. Había, aunque sea, una referencia. En la Constitución lo... Española no hay ninguna referencia Nada. a memoria democrática, por supuesto. Ni tampoco era... a la guerra, en sentido no, de no. las personas que murieron, ¿no? Ni nada. No, no, era un tema en aquellos momentos que había que correr un tupido velo. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Lo mío más que preguntas un poco, aclarar lo que preguntaba la chica esta, en el caso de la arqueología forense, 
a nivel de legislación estaría de la siguiente forma. Primero primaría la ley de la memoria democrática, como ha dicho él, después estaría la ley penal y por último ya estaría el contexto de la ley de patrimonio histórico. Dependiendo un poco del caso y del contexto de la sumación, iría un poco registrado en ese, en ese orden. No sé si está... ¿Se ha conectado? Tendría que hablar con la CRES. ¿Lo voy presentando? O... A ver. Eh, a continuación estará con nosotros la doctora Elena Calandra, directora del Instituto Central de Arqueología, Dirección General de Arqueología, Bellas Artes y Paisaje del Ministerio de Cultura de Italia. Eh, su comunicación versará sobre los arqueólogos y la investigación arqueológica en Italia, formación, competencias, legislación y perspectiva profesional. Se conectarán unos, en unos segundos. La comunicación va a ser online. Um, I, I was just uh, introducing myself with the greetings uh, uh, from uh, our general directors, director uh, uh, Luigi La Rocca. Uh, I am uh, the director of the Central Institute for Archaeology. Uh, that is uh, an autonomous institute uh, uh, within the General Directorate for Archaeology, Fine Arts and Landscape. May you he hear me? Yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry. May you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I will outline today some reflections using the materials we are working on precisely within our institute about the archaeologists. Non gira. Ok. Uh, about uh, uh, since uh, we uh, we talk about archaeologists and archaeological research, as first thing we may start with archaeologists. May you hear me? Yes. <laughs> may you hear me? Yes. Excuse me, may you hear me? There is no more translation at the moment. May you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Fine, adesso, fine. Um, in Italy, the archaeologist profession is uh, among those that are not regulated, such as the physical anthropologist, archivist, librarian, demo-ethnoanthropologist, diagnostics expert and art historian. For the first time, the law on preventive archaeology approved in uh, 2005 Uh, mentions uh, the level of training of professional archaeologists in charge of specific activities. The person in charge of collecting and evaluating of previous data, phase zero, preliminary study, has obtained a PhD or spe specialization school, an Italian only academic qualification, which corresponds to a two year course after the master's degree. At that time, the word archeologist was never mentioned in the Italian code of cultural heritage in force from 2004. The code has been modified in 2014 following the enactment of law 110 of uh, 2014.
this law indeed has laid the foundations for the Ministry of Culture to finally establish an ambiguous academic qualification and professional experience criteria equivalent to the IEQF European Qualification Framework defined defining the professional identity of archaeologists. Another decree of 2019 articulates the archaeologists in three professional areas. They can work as a professional uh, with the coordination of more expert colleagues after obtaining a three-year degree and with one year of experience, bachelor degree, while tasks can be carried out more articulated when the master degree is obtained. The planning and coordination activities can only be carried out by archaeologists with a postgraduate qualification in possession of adequate experience, uh, EQF 8 level. The role and tasks of the um, archaeologist in preventive archaeology is regulated today by the current Public Works Code Legislative Decree 36 of this year, of 2003, particularly in the Annex uh, 1.8, uh, which does not change this framework. Uh, now, uh, let's speak uh, and expand a couple of words about uh, the uh, activities of uh, the, Gen Directorate, the, the General Directorate uh, who coordinates territorial superintendencies, uh, which exercise scientific direction for all archaeological excavations. Uh, the, um, Sectors are preventive archaeology and excavations under uh, concession. Uh, even if the Malta Convention has been ratified in Italy only in 2015, policies for the protection of the archaeological heritage are deeply rooted in Italian regulatory framework. Uh, for this reason, um, ratification did not require any major changes to the law, the principle of which were already fully in line with the Malta Convention. The principle of Malta are, uh, I can just read, attention to the inventories of cultural heritage, um, movable and immovable, obligation to report any archaeological finds, ban on the permanent export of cultural goods outside the uh, national territory, attention to the protection, conservation and in situ enhancement of archaeological sites. To keep in mind, of course, is the concept of protection as it is understood and practiced today, notably by Article 3 uh, of the Code uh, Legislative Decree uh, of the 2004. Uh, the uh, preventive uh, verification, uh, the check uh, in advance of archaeological interest, moreover, has been carried out for a long time, albeit not always in the last decades of the 20th century, but the date of its birth legally stands in 2005. This was followed by the formalization of the Public Works Code of 2006, uh, and uh, um, followed by another public works code in 2016, now repealed and replaced by the latest one this year. It is uh, interesting uh, to note that uh, the uh, procedure is uh, regulated by uh, different um, laws and with different objectives 
one of uh, on the one hand the cultural heritage code still the same although with amendments and uh, and transformations also and on the other hand the successive public works codes in fact, it should not be forgotten that the decision-making powers of the superintendent are already provided for uh, already in the, the cultural heritage code. Uh, we can here. Uh, I am. Uh, um, uh, showing uh, uh, the excavation, the, the uh, uh, kind of excavations before uh, the law, the first law that were uh, considered as emergency searches and after uh, the law where they uh, become preventive searches. In this regulatory framework, the action of our general directorate is that uh, of careful supervision, uh, first of all, of the time frames as provided for by the laws in force. The authorization processes are given to the center, for example, the environmental impact assessment, as we call them, and the strategic environmental assessment. Recently, we have the works of the PNRR, National Resilience and Recovery Plan. Um, now, uh, we can uh, uh, we can say that with uh, uh, the uh, here uh, we see the uh, precedent uh, laws, but uh, um, uh, I have to underline that uh, now uh, the last uh, code of contracts, uh, the number fifty, uh, is uh, still in force for ongoing procedures. Definit definitively. Uh, it will be repealed from uh, the beginning of the next year. Now, uh, we uh, are using this new code that is in force from uh, the uh, first day of July uh, for the new procedures. And uh, that is, um, um, we have to note that until uh, the end of this year, the preceding code applies to ongoing processes. Uh, at the same time, in this period of uh, continuous reform of the laws, the General Directorate promptly drafts explanatory documents for the superintendencies for each regulatory innovation toward uh, the immediate application. We have uh, uh, at the moment uh, the current guidelines that uh, have been published uh, the last year and that uh, replaced uh, the preceding documents, uh, ministerial circulars that are no longer in force. Now uh, I show the uh, the present uh, workflow with the phase zero preliminary study, archival and bibliographic data, surveys and photo interpretation. The first phase, uh, first direct surveys, geophysical surveys, uh, coring excavation trenches, and the phase two excavations in extension, extensive excavation on large areas to verify the results. And uh, here just a, a look of uh, the uh, preceding situation. And uh, now uh, we uh, make documentation before, in every case, before the start of the works. Now we change uh, uh, our topic because uh, it is uh, helpful to, uh, to dedicate some words uh, to uh, the excavations uh, under concession because they are an important part of uh, for uh, uh, the archaeology in Italy. Uh, and uh, because uh, the excavations of the universities 
uh, are in connection with training. Uh, they are a very important moment uh, for the didactics provided within uh, this framework of the uh, university research, with, which is carried out under a uh, concessionary regime. Uh, this is a legal institution that uh, the, la concessione di scavo, we, uh, we say, uh, that is a legal institution uh, that concerns uh, the excavations and non-invasive investigations. Um, as, uh, as far as archaeological research is concerned, uh, in Italy, it is a, a um, public prerogative, a state prerogative, la concessione di scavo, exercised through the Ministry of Culture, whose uh, fundamental task, I'm sorry, there is, a, okay, um, um, I'm sorry, but I check always uh, if <laughs> everything is okay. Um, the, the concessione di scavo um, is a prerogative and a fundamental task uh, of the ministry culture that can uh, entrust this task to uh, the universities. Um, with uh, the scientific direction of excavations is entrusted uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of non-invasive investigation is entrusted to the superintendencies. Uh, otherwise, um, the final decree for la concessione di scavo is signed by the general director, uh, Luigi La Rocca. Um, here I show just the statistics uh, about the concessions uh, over uh, these uh, um, last uh, five years uh, with uh, the gap, of course, uh, for uh, the pandemic situation. But now uh, we are uh, working again uh, almost uh, like before. Uh, Another, uh, another aspect is uh, the documentation after the excavation. The Malta Convention uh, was involved in, funding uh, in the funding must, uh, the, 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 there was this must to uh, uh, find uh, money, in order to cover study and publication. And also other uh, recommendations of uh, the Ministry Culture were in this direction, pointing out the need to facilitate access to the archives of superintendencies uh, with involvement in the publication of professionals in the study. Uh, and also before the law, the first law uh, was uh, interested to digital formats, uh, 3D reconstructions, uh, public communication of results. But at the end, only the decree of the last year uh, fixed as law the GIS, uh, the SIT application, uh, and decided for single national standard for the preparation of preliminary documentation and publication on a specific geoportal. Now, Uh, I changing uh, and transforming this speech in uh, um, the presentation of uh, the uh, National Geoportal for Archaeology uh, that was uh, um, that is uh, the uh, product, uh, the work of the Central Institute for Archaeology. 
The Central Institute for Archaeology was born in 2016. It belongs to the General Directorate, as, as we have seen. The staff is composed of five archaeologists, one technical employee, two administrative employees, a communicator and an IT technician who arrived one month ago. The Institute, according to the organization decrees, uh, adopts uh, every useful initiative in order to permit uh, the definition and application of guidelines, standards and necessary coordination measures to ensure the development of study and research in the field of archaeology. At the same time, it promotes the recognition of documentation of databases uh, and of the available archives in superintendencies, archaeological parks, museums, in order to achieve a unified map of archaeological potential on a national scale, reaching the online publication. This is what we are uh, doing now and what uh, uh, I, uh, I'll explain from this moment because our uh, Geoportale Nazionale per l'Archeologia, the National uh, Geoportal for Archaeology in Italy, was born today. So it is a honor for me uh, to uh, introduce it uh, for the first time abroad in uh, this very, very uh, important uh, convention. Uh, which, uh, which kind of data are uh, available in this uh, geoportal, the data of the preventive archaeology interventions and other MIC protection activities in the works, for example, not, uh, in, not public for private uh, works. The census of archives and archaeological databases and the spatial data collected by universities and research institutions, in particular the spatial, da spa spatial data from excavation in con under concession. Uh, these are the income data, the outcome data are the dissemination with different degrees of depth of field investigations, starting from raw data. The data sharing in open format of archaeological spatial, da spatial data and also uh, as uh, ICA we uh, produce guidelines and documentation standards as templates and micro manuals. Now let me, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, a few words about uh, the standards uh, of the National uh, Geoportal of Archeo for Archaeology, uh, documentation of preventive archaeology, results of assistance and emergency searches, data processed in uh, the context of research activities, as we have seen before. And uh, the expected results, uh, uh, I don't like to read uh, the PowerPoints, but maybe uh, it is more practical to do it. The creation of uh, a minimal knowledge base on archaeological heritage, uh, shareable and uh, updatable, because uh, to update the data at this moment is uh, basic. Uh, to support, uh, to, to give, to provide the support for that accessibility and document retentation needs by uh, offices. Uh, dissemination of description standards harmonized with the national catalog system. Definition of minimum levels of data access for different categories of users at, at the end, updating the catalog system with new uh, discoveries. Other expected results 
uh, are uh, to provide a minimum set of to publish because we are online a minimum set of information available to all users even even without accreditation opening data is the key words of our times publication of data on the position of surveys and the archaeological property and uh, also to give uh, space to the data uh, that uh, were before not published, uh, only data uh, whose dissemination would create uh, protection problems. So we are very, very careful to not publish, for example, um, data about uh, uh, graves or uh, precious uh, <laughs> Uh, context that are not published. Uh, the numbers, uh, there are a lot, you may uh, read them, but we are just starting. We are at the beginning of this uh, process. So today is uh, the, birth, the first day of life for uh, JNA, but uh, will improve uh, more and more. Now, uh, just um, another um, some words about uh, this uh, this problem about the workflow, because uh, at the beginning of the work, the archaeologist downloads the data available at the GNA GNA. Uh, by means uh, of a QGS plugin, existing data can be corrected or updated uh, based on new studied, studies. Thanks to the same plugin, data related to new discoveries is sent to the, NAT, the, the, to the GNA for publication. So the result is that anyone starting a new field search can start from an updated inventory of available data. Okay, it's okay. Just a uh, uh, few minutes in order to uh, introduce this uh, uh, new, very new uh, uh, GNA. Uh, with uh, just I show uh, the um, uh, uh, the screenshots uh, because it is uh, available, it is published, so it is just a little introduction. Uh, about uh, the different kinds of data. Uh, the data raccolti con standard GNA uh, are uh, the data from preventive archaeology collected with uh, standard, with uh, GNA standards. Uh, the excavations and uh, not, inv uh, not uh, uh, invasive actions uh, for uh, the uh, second, uh, this second section. The third section is uh, the general catalog of uh, our Central Institute for Catalog and Documentation. And in uh, the same uh, home page, uh, another uh, section, uh, altre banche dati, other uh, data, um, databases, uh, where uh, we at the moment have published published just one database, but in the future we want to uh, share uh, the research and the results of the research, uh, for example, of the PhD dissertations or of other works, assistant works and so on. Now, uh, just uh, a, a slide about uh, the, uh, the uh, work group with the names of all uh, the persons uh, that worked uh, to this project that uh, started uh, five years ago. And uh, just uh, some image, some screenshot of a consultation about uh, the GNA data that we have published at the moment. Uh, the numbers are referred to uh, the points and to the sites. Uh, in, of course, uh, uh, every point is uh, uh, georeferenced. And here we, uh, we show here the general map. 
And uh, here uh, a single example uh, about uh, a, a site, a particular site uh, in Puglia, Manfredonia, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the, the image of, uh, um, of the map, of the simple map. But at the same time, it is possible uh, touching the different levels uh, that you uh, may see uh, on the right, we may change also into uh, the photographical air view. And the same point. Um, and here uh, we, um, you, you see uh, the site information sheet that was uh, uh, written, compiled by uh, the uh, employees of the superintendency because uh, the central work was done by us, but uh, all the data come from the superintendencies, of course. We continue with uh, the uh, concession uh, excavation, the, the excavations under concession, and uh, we have two different layers. The uh, red points are for the excavations uh, in Italy, and uh, uh, the blue point, uh, we are just starting with this part, for uh, the excavations abroad of the Italian um, archaeologists uh, abroad. And it is uh, interesting because so we uh, we may uh, make an exchange with uh, the different uh, national systems where uh, they they have. We continue with uh, with the, uh, the concessions in uh, in Italy, in Dagini in concessione. Uh, the number is higher because uh, here you see uh, just uh, the sites, but uh, for every site uh, there are more campaigns, so more years. And uh, we continue yeah, with uh, a screenshot a very particular about uh, the same site of Manfredonia. Sipontum with uh, the, um, the sheet about uh, the, the uh, description, the abstract of uh, the um, report of the excavation. And here the abstract della relazione scientifica that is also translated into English. Uh, and uh, now uh, the uh, general catalog of ICCD, that is uh, our uh, central institute for uh, catalog, that, um, uh, which, um, whose standards are for us low, as a law. And we uh, used uh, these standards uh, to build this new system that is uh, the inventory of the interventions, of the dynamic interventions, and not of uh, the uh, just of uh, the cultural uh, heritage. The cultural heritage is stored by the general catalog, but by this one, by uh, the catalogo generale dei beni culturali. Again, Manfredonia, the site of Manfredonia, where you may see in violet and yellow uh, the points of uh, the other maps, because uh, every uh, site may uh, be um, used and seen uh, from uh, every database, every one of the four databases. Uh, here, uh, just the map of uh, uh, the uh, cultural heritage, not of the interventions in uh, Manfredonia. And here, uh, the sheet of uh, uh, the general catalog. And uh, at the end, uh, altre banche dati, another database that is uh, a um, uh, censimento, census, uh, that was uh, an old database uh, of the first year uh, of of the first year of this uh, century that was uh, uh, never published that now we have imported and uh, uh, published according to our standards. We continue uh, just uh, with uh, this uh, uh, with uh, showing uh, the description of the census uh, project 
and uh, here uh, you may see in green the points of the census project uh, with uh, the little sheet. Uh, now, uh, just a few words about the other um, storage systems, uh, uh, the, uh, the other databases, because um, in, uh, for us, uh, this was the first one uh, for the archaeology, and uh, especially for the, uh, the dynamic data for the uh, interventions. But before we have uh, um, the CJEC web, that is uh, the uh, ICCD catalog uh, that I have explained uh, a few minutes ago. ago. Uh, we have also uh, the, another database uh, that is Vincoli in Rete, uh, that, um, that is uh, uh, compatible, interoperable with us, and uh, new, different uh, systems uh, um, as Raptor and uh, as the CITAR of Rome. Uh, these systems were used in Northern Italy, Raptor, and uh, in Rome for the CITAR. Uh, they don't use uh, uh, ICCD as a standard, but we are uh, converting the standards in order to harvest all this data and to avoid to repeat uh, the data entry of the same uh, of the same data because uh, the our philosophy is of the reuse always and uh, with the uh, geoportal we are uh, trying in every case to reduce. And uh, um, this is the case of uh, the other, delle altre banche dati that uh, I, uh, was, uh, I was showing. Just to uh, finish, uh, we, um, uh, I would have a lot of things to do, but uh, I don't want, uh, since this, uh, Communication is not so easy. Uh, um, I prefer to uh, stop here, but I'm uh, available for uh, questions. And uh, if you have uh, uh, suggestions, uh, questions uh, afterward, we may uh, write to, to us uh, to contact us. It is very easy to uh, speak with us. So uh, now uh, I, I prefer to uh, stop with the uh, sharing. And uh, even if you can see me, it doesn't matter, of course, I would like to see you in case of discussion. I'm very sorry, but... <laughs> Um, may now... you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We have now uh, the moment of the questions. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I'm sorry because uh, there is this problem uh, that I didn't know in... Uh, uh, of the server of yes, uh, we we have uh, this problem with the server, uh, uh, so it is impossible to see me. But it doesn't. Si, sí, Elena, mi senti. Mi senti Elena? Sì. Buongiorno, sono Manuel dal, dal convegno. Ti ringraziamo del tuo intervento, ti chiediamo delle scuse per degli inconvenienti tecnici, per così dire, e non ci sono eh, questioni dalla parte del pubblico. Dunque eh, ci metteremo d'accordo con te via email per eh, la consegna del testo e via, e via dicendo. Ecco, scusatemi, per, spero che almeno si sia sentito si è, e visto quello che proiettavamo. Si è sentito benissimo, si è capito ancora meglio 
e tutte le immagini sono state godute dalla, da tutto il pubblico qui a, nella sala e nella sala virtuale. Ti ringraziamo ecco. ancora eh, e buongiorno. E vi ringraziamo noi, io mi scuso, I apologize because at the same time At the same time, I am involved in another convention about preventive archaeology today at Sapienza, and so uh, I have to come back to our convention here. I am very sorry. Thank you for this possibility. No, thank you very much for your effort. E grazie ancora da parte del dottor Luigi. Ti prego salutare al, al professore Di Luca. Buongiorno thank ancora, you. forte abbraccio. Grazie. Eh, y además de la, de la interviniente italiana, si hay alguna pregunta para alguno de los ponentes de esta, de esta mañana, recordamos que tenemos reservado todavía unos minutillos para, para preguntas, así que si alguien quiere. No es obligado, ¿eh? como tendremos ocasión de vernos a lo largo de hoy y de mañana, y ellos estarán aquí, estarán encantados. De, de atender a todo el mundo. Pues muchas gracias.